get the message started. So are you ready for the Word of God? Amen. Let's pray and we're going to get right into it. Heavenly Father, as we get into your Word, thank you so much for this opportunity. Your Word is so powerful. Your Word brings a light to our, our understanding. Your Word helps us to understand things that we may not be able to understand in the natural, but Your Word is there to answer those questions, Father. And so we come humbly before Your Word, and I trust that the Holy Spirit would give me utterance, and that the Holy Spirit would just bring fresh illumination to our hearts about the things of heaven and the things of eternity. And, and so, uh, Father, I thank You for Your help and strength in Jesus' mighty name. I want to talk about what happens when a believer dies. What happens when a believer dies. And listen, you can go out into the world and try to find answers to what happens when, when, a, when someone dies and so forth. If you go out in the world, there's many avenues. You'll, you'll hear many things out there in the world. But listen, don't be led by experiences. There's only one sure place that you can get the answer, and that's the Word of God. Amen. Experiences can change, and so forth. Amen? Experiences can change, but God's Word does not change. And so, th so this morning, we're going to go into the Word of God and see what God has to say. For the, the next four Sundays, we're going to talk about what, what happens when a believer dies. But really, to be honest with you, this Sunday, I'm kind of going to lay the groundwork for what happens. So I'm going to kind of cover some things that might be a little bit uncomfortable for some of you, but these are, these are in the Word of God, and we need to cover these things. But next Sunday, I'm going to start laying out precisely those things that happens when a person dies. Now, some of these things I get to share in funerals, but not on, you know, I don't see you guys in funerals. So, you know, so some of you have, you, know, you have questions and whatever, so that's why I feel like, well, I need to bring it out to our body because a lot of them don't know. They, they don't attend funerals or whatever, so they're not hearing messages like this. And so you need to know. Amen? So, again, so there's a question, this is a question that needs to be answered because if you're not sure of what happens when a believer dies, then guess what? Fear of the unknown can cripple you and put you in bondage. So that you're not able to enjoy life and carry out God's will for your life. But there's some things that we first need to understand that I'm going to cover uh, today. Before we really, you're going to see some of the answers already, but I'm going to get into a little more detail on the answers next week. But today I'm laying the groundwork. Here's the first thing I want you to know. Here's the first thing you need to understand before we talk about what happens to a believer. What happens when a believer dies. First thing you need to understand is that you don't have to fear death. If you're a believer, you don't have to fear death. Amen. In fact, I want you to go to Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 2, verse 9. Notice what the Bible says. It's talking about here when Jesus would show up on the earth and, and what he had done for us. And then notice verse 9. But we see now Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels, for the suffering of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, listen, by the grace of God, might taste death for everyone. Amen. Jesus, by the grace of God, tasted death for everyone. I don't know about you, but I like that. Amen. Amen? The, one of the reasons we shouldn't fear death is because as a believer, Jesus, Jesus went ahead of us. He tasted death ahead of us. Amen? Now, now uh, this verse here, I, I do want to put this in, uh, in the message and then in the amp, this verse 9, if possible here. In the message and then in the amplified if we can. Notice, but we don't see it yet. Don't see everything under human jurisdiction. What we do see is Jesus made not quite as high as angels and then through the experience of death crowned so many higher than an angel, go on, with a glory bright with Eden's dawn light, in that death, by God's grace, listen, he what? Fully experienced death in every person's place. Jesus fully experienced death in every person's place. Now put this in, one more in the Amplified here. 
Look at verse, in the Amplified Bible, in verse 9. But we are able to see Jesus, who was ranked lower than the angels for a little while, crowned with glory and honor because of his having suffered death, in order that by grace, unmerited favor of God to us sinners, he might what? He might, the next part? Is it up? There it is. He might experience, I like that, death for every individual person. Jesus experienced death for every individual person. So you could say Jesus experienced your death for you. See, he took you to the cross. You were buried with him, and so he took your death with you. He experienced death for you. But then now let's go back to Hebrews, and let's keep reading in verse 14 and 15. Look at this. Verse 14 and 15. Inasmuch then as children have partaken of flesh and blood, he himself, talking about Jesus, likewise shared in the same, that through what? Death he might what? Destroy him who had the power of death, that is what? Come on now. Jesus came to destroy him who had the power of death, which is what? The devil. Look at verse 15. And release those who through fear of death were all their lifetime subject to what? Bondage. Let's, let's look at this in a couple of translations. CV, verse 14 and 15. Notice what it says here. We are people of flesh and blood. That is why Jesus became one of us. He died to what? Destroy the devil who had power over death. Verse 15. But he also died to what? Rescue all of us who live each day in what? See, there's a lot of people that fear death. There's a lot of people that are living their life in fear of death. But Jesus came to destroy that fear from your life. Amen? Let's look at that in the message real quick and then the Amplified. Since the children are made of flesh and blood, it's logical that the Savior took on flesh and blood in order to rescue them by His death. By embracing death, taking it into Himself, He destroyed the devil's hold on death and freed all who what? Cower through life, scared to death of death. How many know people scared to death of what? Of death. And then finally in, in the Amplified. Since therefore these his children share in flesh and blood in the physical nature of human beings, he himself in a similar manner partook of the same nature that by going through death he might bring to naught and what else? And make of no effect him who had the power of death, that is the devil, go on, and also that he might deliver, listen, and completely set free all those who through the haunting fear of death were held in bondage throughout the whole course of their lives. There's people that are living with a fear of death, fear of dying. You don't have to fear death as a believer. Because no. Jesus destroyed death. He experienced death in your place. Now I'm going to get a little bit ahead of myself. Then what happens to a believer when he dies? It's a quick transition. <coughs> Amen. It's a quick transition. But now, I don't want to get into full details because we're going to talk about it later. Listen, another thing you need to understand. You don't have to fear death, right? Here's the other thing you need to understand. You will not cease to exist. Amen. 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Did you know that? You will not cease to exist. A lot of people in the world think that, well, you know what? When I die, you know, when, when I'm dead, I'm gone. I'm like a dog. I'll be dead and gone. And nobody will worry about me anyway. I'm, I'm dead and gone. Listen, no, you got to understand something. Notice what the Bible says in 1 Thessalonians 5.23. Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you completely. And may your whole spirit, listen, soul and body be preserved blameless at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now this is a powerful scripture. First, God says the one is He's going to set you apart completely. God is the one that's setting you apart completely. And He says, may your whole spirit, soul, and body be preserved blameless at the coming of Lord Jesus. Now listen, that shows you that we are spirit beings. The reason you don't die as a dog is because when God made you, when, he, when you were created, when, 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 when the sperm and, 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 and when, when, when you were created right there, God's spirit came into you and infuse those, that cell that, that ended up becoming you. Amen? 
Just like when God made Adam, he made his flesh, but then he, what, he breathed his life into Adam and he became a living soul. In the same way, when you were created, I, God placed a spirit within you and that spirit lives forever. You became like God in the fact that you have a spirit. You're not God, but you came like, became like Him in that you have a spirit. That's why you don't die. When you die, you don't die like a dog. That's just your flesh that dies. But your spirit and your soul live on with the Lord. Amen. Now, that's important. See, you, you need to understand that you're a spirit, you have a soul, and you live in a body. God, the Bible says God is a spirit. Some people ask the question, well, who made God? Well, who said He had to be made? He's always existed. He's always existed. In, in, in the spirit realm, there really is no time. Scientists say that if you go at the speed of light, time stops. God's always existed. Amen. We, because we live in a time zone, it's hard for us to comprehend that because we live in time. But in God's, that's why the Bible says with the Lord, a thousand, a thousand years is like a day with the Lord and a day is like a thousand years. Because with Him, so you could say in God's standard, he's been, Jesus has been gone two days, almost two thousand years. In God's eyes, it's like he's been gone just two days. Come on now. Listen, and, and in fact, the light, the light that, that's coming from some of these stars, they, they, it's been coming for thousands of years. Yeah. Right? And, and so it's amazing, but again, Adam, see, Adam's body was made of dust. God breathed life into him. So far with us, God, God placed a spirit within each and every one of us. Anybody have a glove? I should, have, I should have forgot about that. You know, have you seen a glove? You know, when you put on a glove? I like to say it this way. I like to illustrate it like a glove illustration. The, the, the body is like the glove. And my hand here would be my spirit. Amen? But when I die, the glove is removed. But there's still my spirit body. So all, when, a pers when a person dies, the glove is removed, their body, the outer part of them is removed, and their spirit exists still. Amen? Their spirit lives on. Now this is important to understand, because a lot of people, you know, they think, like I said, you know, I'm, I'm just going to die and I'm going to be no more. No, you're going to live, because you, you, you have, God, that's how, that shows you how special you are, that God said, I'm going to make you a spirit being, and you're going to live forever. Now, God took a risk because he knew not everybody would, would believe in him, but he took a risk because he want, it was the father and his family. The Bible says, I pray to, Paul says, I pray to the father of the family in heaven and on earth. There's a family of God in heaven and there's a family on earth. And so, and so your spirit, that's why, that's why Jesus said, listen, you were born from your mama, that's flesh. You need to born, be born of the spirit. You were born once through your mom, but you were spiritually dead. You need to be born again of the Spirit. So that why? Because flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. See, that's the other issue. We could never go to heaven with these bodies because it couldn't. we would melt in the presence of God. These bodies couldn't handle it. So we're either going to have to die, and then, or if Jesus comes, some of us are not going to die at all as far as physically. When Jesus comes, and I believe it's soon in the rapture, we will, the Bible says we're going we're to get into it in another Sunday. We're going to be changed instantly in a twinkling of an eye. And, and those that have died in Christ, their bodies will be resurrected first, and then we'll meet them with, with the Lord in the air. Amen? But listen, to point this out again, let's go to Matthew 22, 23, real quick. I want to lay this groundwork that you're a spirit being. The reason it's so important that you understand what will happen to you when you die is you need to understand you're a spirit being. Here are the story in Matthew 22, 23. They were trying to get on Jesus. The same day the Sadducees, now the Sadducees did not believe in, in spirit. They didn't believe in the resurrection. That's why they were sad, you see. The same day the Sadducees, who say there is no resurrection, came to him and asked him, verse 24, saying, Teacher, Moses said that if a man dies, having no children, his brother shall marry his wife and raise up offspring for her brother. Verse 25. Now there were there with us seven brothers. The first died and after he had married, and having no offspring, he left his wife to his brother. Verse 26. Likewise the second also and the third, even to the seventh. So in other words, this lady married all the brothers, didn't have any kids. They all died. Bless her, bless her, 
Bless her darling heart. Verse 27. <laughs> last of all, last of all, the woman died also. Look at verse 28. Therefore, in the resurrection, because see, the Sadducees didn't believe that. In other words, there's going to be an afterlife. Whose wife of the seven will she be? For they all had her as wife. Have you ever wondered that? Amen? Look at, Jesus answered and said to them, you guys are mistaken. Listen, what he tells them. Not knowing the what? So they didn't know the word. What else? Nor the power of God. What God can do. Look at verse 30. For in the resurrection they neither what? Marry nor are given in marriage, but are like angels of God in heaven. Amen? Like I told my wife, you can visit me. We won't be married anymore. But, you know, I'll visit your mansion. You can visit mine whenever you want. Amen? Verse 31. But check, the, but check out what Jesus says here. This is very interesting. Check this out. Because I know she's going to have elephants in her lot. She loves elephants. Amen? I'm going to have pine trees and lakes and stuff like that. Verse 31. But concerning the resurrection of the dead, notice, have you not read what was spoken to you by God? Saying, look at this, verse 32. I am the God of what? Abraham. The God of what? Isaac and the God of Jacob. Here it is. God is not the God of the dead, but of the what? Come on now. Amen. So what is Jesus? You're missing the point. That person, you say they died. They died in their flesh. But that person is living. Amen. That person lives on. He's the God of the living, not the God of the dead. He's trying to show those, those uh, Sadducees, you guys got it all wrong. There is an afterlife. Your spirit lives on. God is the God of living pe people, not dead people. Their bodies died, but they're alive. Yes, their spirit is more alive than, in fact, you're, when you die, if you were to die before Jesus comes, you're, gonna, you're more alive then than you are now. Amen. Amen. So a person never, so here's my point, a person never really dies. Their, yes, their body, but not their spirit and soul. Amen. They live on. It's where they live on that we need to talk about. So here's another point, though, I want to bring about. I'm laying the foundation for the things we're going to cover. Here's another thing. So you don't have to fear death. We talked about that. You will not cease to exist. That's why people need to be born again. They need a new spirit in order to live on with the Lord. Because if they're not born again, then they're going to still be spiritually dead and they're going to live somewhere else we're going to talk about. Mm -hmm. You can't talk about heaven without talking about where others will go, but I just want to lay that groundwork and then we'll go into all the nice, good stuff. <laughs> Here's the other thing I want you to get across you will continue to be conscious. I want to bring this across because you, you read scriptures in the Bible where they're, they're asleep. That is, some people think that they're soul sleep or that there's an intermediate state when you die or purgatory. That's all tradition. The Bible just says nothing about any of those things. There's no such thing as soul sleep. You know, their soul is asleep and then Jesus is going to wake them up. It's their body that's going to be right, risen. But, but, but we're going to get into it later. Now listen. So you will, you will continue to be conscious. There's no such thing as soul sleep. When you just sleep, when, where you just sleep, then wake up when the Lord returns at the rapture. No. You, why? You're a spirit being. You're, you continue to live. Amen. There's no such thing like you're going to just be laying there. And some people think they, that their loved one's dead and, and they're there in the, in the grave. No. Their body is there. But their, their spirit is not. That's right. Amen? Now let me give you some scriptures here. Look at, for believers, now I'm going to mention where are believers? About, are, they, are believers conscious? Look at this. Believers are conscious. Look at uh, Psalm 73. Let's start reading verse 23. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold me by my right hand. Verse 24. You will guide me with your counsel. Listen. And afterward receive me to what? Glory. Come on now. So for the believer is received to what? To glory. Right? In fact, go to Luke chapter 9, verse 28. The, uh, well, back up to verse 25 of this one. I forget. Whom, I have, whom have I in heaven but you? And there is none upon earth that I desire besides you. Amen. Amen. But check this out. Another uh, thing about a believer being conscious after they die, their body dies. Look at 9. Remember when Jesus was transfigured? Remember that? He, the, Jesus took the disciples up to the mountain, three of them, and he was transfigured on the mountain. Yes. Notice, look at verse 28 of Luke chapter 9. Now it came to pass, 
after about eight days, these sayings, that he took Peter, John, and James and went up on the mountain to pray. Verse 29, as he prayed, the appearance of his face was altered and his robe became white and glistening. You know what happened? You know what Jesus did? He let them see into the spirit realm to see how he looked in the spirit. And so they began to see his glory. Oh, if you could see yourself in the spirit, you would look glorious. Verse 30, and behold, look at this though. Two men talked with him who were what? Who were they? Moses, Moses and Elijah. Look at, who, listen, who appeared what? Notice, Psalms just said they were taken up in glory. Here says they appeared in what? In glory, right? And spoke of his decease, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. So here you have Moses and Elijah appearing and talking to Jesus. And it's obvious that Peter later on says, oh, should we build a, 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 a tent for, for Moses, one for Elijah, one for you? Obviously, Peter recognized who they were. So these are people in the Old Testament that had died, yet, listen, they were recognizable. And listen, they were talking to Jesus. They were not in soul sleep. They were talking to Jesus. These are men out of the Old Testament that were talking to Jesus. So they, notice, they were talking to Jesus about him going to the cross, about what he was going to call his Jerusalem. It's almost like God must have sent Moses and Elijah, they had a little conference with Jesus. And it's almost, and, and, and listen, and then Peter goes, hey, uh, uh, should we build a temple for you, you Lord, and them? And, and the Lord finally has to show up and say, no, 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 no. This is my beloved son. Hear him. We're not under the law anymore. We're not under the prophets anymore. We're under, God speaks to us through his son now. Amen. Hear him. Amen. We're under the new covenant. See what I'm saying? And so, and so, again, that shows you that these people who had died, their flesh had died, they were very active, they were talking. So, notice, there's a body in the Spirit. That is, there is some type of body that you're going to have in the Spirit until you receive your glorified body. We'll talk about that later when we get into that. I don't want to give you all everything yet because I'm laying, I'm laying the, the, the groundwork. So Moses and Elijah appeared in glory and spoke with Jesus. They were obviously very much alive and speaking. They were not in soul sleep like some people say. Now here, check this out. How about the unbeliever though? This is not good news for the unbeliever. Isaiah 14, 9 through 11. Look at this. Isaiah 14, 9 through 11. This was talking to one of the kings of Babylon who, was, who God was pronouncing judgment on what would happen to that king. And notice what the Bible says. So that king's body's dead, right? He's going to die, right? But notice what happens to him, though. His spirit, his soul. Listen, verse 9. Hell from beneath you is excited about you. To meet you at your coming. It stirs up the dead for you. All the chief ones of the earth, it has raised up from their thrones. All the kings of the nations, go on, they all speak, they, sh they all shall speak and say to you, have you also become as weak as we? Have you become like us? Verse 11, your pomp is brought down to show, and the sound of your stringed instruments, the maggot is spread under you, and worms cover you. So notice, this is telling me that the person who died, an unbeliever, is very much still alive. Amen. But they're in a different location. And by, by the time we're done, you're going to know where that is. We're going to show it to you very plainly. So an unbeliever here in hell, notice that there's activity there in hell. Notice the activity. There's things going on. It's not in no soul sleep. There's nothing, not dead like a dog. Something is going on. Amen? There is a hell to shun and a heaven to gain. Amen. Right? Amen. Amen? But now though, let's talk about this. Again, the, the, you know, this is the reality of what the scripture says. Why? If everything else in the Bible is true, this is true too. Amen. Right? Amen? Now, where did the Old Testament saints and sinners go when they died, though? 
This will kind of give you clarity about this situation. Where, let me ask this, answer this question. Where did all the Old Testament saints and sinners go when they died? Now, I'm going to show you an image. He's going to put it up there for me. When you get ready, go ahead and show me that Old Testament uh, Hades image when you got that. The other one, please. Notice, I'm going to show you this, and you can look it up there. This is a great example, and this will make it very plain for you what's happening here. And this will, this will answer some questions or whatever. What happens? you got to understand the Bible. When the Bible talks, the, uh, the place where people go after they die, where their spirit's soul, whatever, it's called Sheol. S-H-E-O-L. Sheol. And, and notice, the circumference, that's the earth, okay? The circumference is the earth. And notice the little grave site on top. See the little grave site on top there? That's where the person's body is laid. So they're in the what? In the surface of the earth, six feet under, right? A person's body is laid there. The body goes to the grave, but the, in the Old Testament, there was two compartments. Jewish people spoke about it, and I'm going to show you from Scripture that Jesus even spoke about it. There was two compartments. The body goes to the grave, the soul goes to Hades. Now, King James interpret. People get confused in the King James because the King James will interpret it hell, but hell also is interpreted hates. So, actually, in the Old Testament, it was supposed to be interpreted shul, and and uh, uh, and and and, and hates and uh, the interpretation. Hades is more the New Testament interpretation. The Greek, Hebrew was the shul, but it was the place of the departed dead, those who had died. Amen. There's two compartments there. I'm going to show you in a little bit. And that's why, in fact, have you heard the scripture in the Bible? Look at this. Uh, uh, um, Acts chapter 2, verse 27. Acts chapter 2, 27. Notice what it says there. Oh, man. I, oh, there it is. Acts chapter 2, verse 27. You, it says, you will not leave my soul in hates. King James says hell. Nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. This is talking, Peter's talking about Jesus, what happened when he died. And it says, he's not going to leave his soul in Hades or hell, and he will not allow his Holy One to see corruption. What's corruption? The body. His body's not going to see corruption, and his soul will not be left in Hades. Mm -hmm. Now, here's a question that's been talked about. Did Jesus go to hell? He did go to hell, but where the fight is, which part of hell? Which part of Hades? And that's where a lot of issues have caused problems and whatever. And, and, but check this out though. Notice. I want you to notice this. Help me to, Lord, help me to lay it out as plainly as I can. I don't want people to get confused. Um, in Acts 27, it says Jesus head, headed to, his, his, it went to Hades. Okay? Now, look at, you, look at the picture. Put that picture back up again for me if you can. Notice, okay, see the two compartments? There's one compartment that Old Testament saints went to. It's called Abraham's bosom or paradise. You see that one on top? The other compartment is the place of torment where unbelievers go. So in the Old Testament, there was two compartments in Hades. Why? Because in the Old Testament, sinners weren't, I mean, believers weren't saved yet. They, they weren't recreated yet. They didn't have a born-again spirit. So God could not take them to heaven. So God had to keep them in a compartment in the center of the earth, in Hades, where there was two compartments. And I'm going to prove it to you right here. Let's go to Luke chapter, uh, Luke chapter um, 16. Yes. Well, you know what? Before we go there, before we go there, go to Luke 23, 39. I want to cover some things first. Some people, ask, let me answer this question. So where did Jesus go then? Did he go into the place of torment? Or did he go into Abraham's bosom or paradise? I'm going to be, I'm going to be, I'm going to be honest with you. I, I, I actually changed my thinking on this. In some places I was taught he went to the place of torment. I can't... One reason that it, it kept coming up me something did not match, and that was this scripture in Luke 23. When Jesus was hanging on the cross, notice what it says. Then one of the criminals who were hanged blasphemed him, saying, 
If you are the Christ, save yourself and us. Look at verse 40. He's hanging on the cross. But the other answering rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? Verse 41. And indeed, we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. There was two thieves hanging with Jesus. One was, was ridiculing Jesus. The other was saying, man, I deserve what I'm getting. You know, that represents us. All of us were like the thieves. If we, but uh, us, we chose to accept Jesus. The other one chose not to. One gets saved, the other one doesn't. Look at verse 4. And so notice what Jesus tells him. He didn't do anything wrong. Verse 42. Then he, said, then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. What an easy way to get saved. All he told Jesus, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. See, we make salvation so difficult. But all this guy said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. He accepted that, he, that Jesus died innocently. He didn't deserve what he was going through. Remember me. When, so he recognized Jesus is Lord. Amen. Amen. That's what saved him. And notice, and look at what Jesus tells him. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today. It didn't say later on. <laughs> right now. Today, you will be with me where? Paradise. That's why I believe Jesus went to paradise, not place of torment. I remember when we first started the church in 2000, 2000, we started the church. I had a lady that visited our church and I was preaching that Jesus was tormented in hell. And she left because of that. She couldn't grab it. She just couldn't get it. She couldn't hold it and whatever. See, because I've been taught that too. Even in faith circles, that's been taught. But something was not clicking with me. And this verse kept hitting me. Jesus said, you're going to be with me today in paradise. Today, in, right now, today in paradise. That day, well, when did, when did, when did Jesus die? Amen? At 3 o'clock. From 9, to th 9 o'clock to 3 o'clock. Amen? But pastor, do you have another scripture that can possibly say that and share that? Well, okay. Let's, let me show you another one. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 18. Remember, remember uh, 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 what Peter was saying here? So notice, Jesus, Jesus told the, the thief, you're going to be with me today in paradise. So Jesus went to the compartment of Abraham's bosom or paradise. Amen. But what did, Pastor, what did he go do there? Those three days, three nights. What was he doing? Look at this. Peter gives, sheds a little bit of light. 1 Peter 3, 18. For Christ also suffered once for sins, the just for the what? The unjust, that he might bring us to God. Listen. Being put to death in the what? Flesh. Flesh. But made alive by the Spirit. See, and the reason I started thinking, wait a minute, we're putting too much, we're putting much too weight on Jesus suffering in hell. So that means the cross wasn't, oh, okay, there you go. That's the point for me. Are you telling me the cross wasn't sufficient? Yet Colossians says that we were reconciled through his body, through the death of his body on the cross. Colossians says the reconciliation happened through the death of his body on the cross. And I saw other scriptures that were pointing, it's pointing, it's what he accomplished. Otherwise, remember, that, remember the visual I gave you on Easter, on Resurrection Sunday? Where Jesus was hanging and he's taking all the judgment and the punishment. So that wasn't enough? See what I'm saying? Those questions were always getting in my mind. Something doesn't line up. And then the scripture popped out. And then, but notice what it says. By whom? Look at verse 19. What happened when he died? By whom also he went and preached to the spirits in prison. Well, how could Jesus be preaching to the spirits in prison if he's suffering? Oh, my dear loved ones. He, he, you, know, you know what happened? I believe he went to paradise, but from paradise he's preaching to the unbelievers and telling them, because notice what it says in the next verse. I believe he was telling everybody in paradise. In other words, any, everybody in hell or Hades. See, King James translates it hell, and that's why people say he went to hell. But you've got to understand, there's two compartments there. He didn't go to the place of torment. He went to the paradise, because there's two compartments. And notice, he went there, what did he say, verse 20? Who formerly, what? Were disobedient, who when once the divine long-suffering waited in the days of Noah, while the ark was being prepared, in which a few, that is, eight souls, were saved through water. So you know what had happened? I think what happened is he, he goes down there to paradise, 
and, and he starts preaching the, hey, I came and, you know, explaining the gospel, what he had accomplished for them. And of course, those in paradise were rejoicing, but he also shared that word with those who would refuse to believe so that they would know the truth why they're being judged. Now, check this out. I want you to go to uh, Luke uh, 16. Now, I'm going to get into something that's not very nice as far as, you know, it's hard. It's a hard scripture. But yet, this is something we got to talk about. So, here's the proof that there was two compartments in the Old Testament. Here's the proof from Luke chapter 16. Okay? Again, right now you might not be rejoicing. You'll be rejoicing later. All right? Look at this. Luke 16. I got to give you the whole word. Not just some of it. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man, Jesus said, who was clothed with purple and fine linen, and he fared, what, sumptuously every day. But there was a certain beggar named Lazarus, full of sores, who was laid at his gate, desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores. So it was that the beggar died. Here's another thing that happens when a believer dies. And was carried by the angels. Where? So paradise is now being called Abraham's bosom. Another name for paradise. He was carried by the angels where? To Abraham's bosom. Now, now this is not a story about the rich man is not saved because he's rich. The poor man is saved because he's poor. That's not what the story is about. Don't get confused. Don't focus on that. That's not what I'm trying to get out here. Focus on this. The rich man also died and was what? He was buried just on the earth, right? He was buried. His body was buried on the earth. But look at the next verse. And being in what? In Where did he go? In Hades. The other compartment named torments in Hades. Being in torments in Hades, he what? Lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham afar off and Lazarus in his bosom. Verse 24, then he cried and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. Verse 25, but Abraham said, Son, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. Verse 26, but look at this. Here's the point. There's, there's two compartments. And besides all this, between us, in other words, between these two compartments, there is a great gulf fixed. So that those who want to pass from here to you cannot. Nor can those from there pass to us. Now that's amazing. That means in the Old Testament, the unbeliever who was in a place of torment could actually see the believers enjoying themselves in the other compartment. And the believers could see those who were being tormented in the Old Testament. And look at the ne next verse. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Now, now before we, before we uh, get into the rest, back up to, back up to a few verses. Uh, what is it, 25 or 26, 24? Back up a little bit. Oh, 23. Back to 23. First of all, I want to show you something. To, to prove that point that people are alive when they die, notice that this, this person who was an unbeliever, he could see. Notice it says he lifted up his eyes. So notice, in the spirit you can see. My point was, you're conscious. You, you are conscious. You're not in soul sleep and whatever. You are ever conscious of things. Notice, notice, he saw Abraham afar off. So you can see. He's wide awake, isn't he? Amen. Right? Verse 24. Go, go to verse 24. The other thing I want to show you. Then he cried. Notice, he had emotions. This person who had died had emotions. He cries. A spirit being here is crying. I know some of you are probably, man, if, if I'm not saved, I'm going to get saved today, Pastor. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Right? No, hell is a place to shun, man. That's right. That's 
Amen? That's an, now, I, I'm motivated by the love of God. I preach on the love of God and everything. I'm motivated. That's what motivates me to love a God. But when, if I get a little bit demotivated, I think about people going to hell and that motivates me again. <laughs> I don't want, I don't know about you, that motivates me living for, for my family, living for my kids, because I don't want none of them to go there. So if you don't feel any motivation by the love of God, read the scripture for a while and if you don't get motivated for a little bit, right? <laughs> Again, and it shouldn't be this, but that's, that's what it takes sometimes for some people. And he says, and notice though, he says, and send Lazarus that he may dip the tip of his finger in water and cool my tongue. Listen, he can still, he can still taste things. He can still uh, feel temperature. He was, just, he was just wanting one little drop just to ooze, just to cool him down just a tad from the pain that he was in. So he could see he was tormented. He could feel pain and he cried. But then let's go on to verse 25. He says, I'm tormented. But Abraham told him, right, remember that in your lifetime. Here's another point. He could remember. Oh. Some of you are wondering, I wonder if my mom or my dad, I wonder if they remember me. Listen, they remember you very well. Anybody that's gone, they're, they're, in fact, their senses are more keen. They're more, why? Because they're in the spirit. They know things now. Yeah. Amen? I heard one minister said one time, they don't really care about what you're, uh, about, you know, little things that you're doing, but they are looking at what you're doing as far as your walk with God. Amen. They see you when you're making progress. Amen. And they see you when you're kind of drifting away from God. They know those things. And notice what he says. You received all your good things and likewise Lazarus evil things, but now he is comforted and you are tormented. Look at verse 26. So notice, in, 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 in these people that are dead, they remember things. And besides this, there's a great gulf, he said there. But let's go on to verse 27. Check this out. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send, uh, send uh, because notice, he asked him, send someone, send someone to tell my brothers what? Back it up. I've got to read it correctly. Uh, and besides all this, between there's a gulf fix, so that those who want to pass from there, you cannot, nor can those pass from, from there to, uh, to us. Go on, verse 27. Then he said, I beg you therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. Verse 28. For I have five brothers. Notice, he remembers. He knows he has five brothers in hell. That they may testify to them, lest they also come to this place of torment. All of a sudden, he's mission-minded now. It's sad, isn't it? Yeah. All of a sudden, now he cares about his brothers getting saved. All of a sudden, missions is on his mind. Listen to me, people. We need to have missions in mind right now. Because there is too late. Amen. So they're, all of a sudden, now, now he's missions minded. He wants somebody. Listen, that shows you that, that somebody here that's, that, that knows he's in hell and whatever, yet he cares about his loved ones. And he, would, he says, hey, I'm stuck here, but I would rather them not come here with me. I want them to go to heaven. I don't want them to experience what I'm experiencing. Amen. So notice, even though he was in hell, he had compassion for his brothers. Are you learning something this morning? Yes. Verse 29. Abraham said to him, they have, notice what Abraham tells him, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. Look at verse, the next verse. And he said, no, Father Abraham, but if one goes to them from the dead, they'll repent. If they, if they see somebody raised from the dead, they're going to really repent. That's what we think. Mm -hmm. And notice what he says. But he said to him, if they don't hear Moses and the prophets, listen, if they don't pay attention to God's word, if they refuse to listen to God's word, they will not be persuaded, though one rise from the dead. That's right. That's right. Look at the Pharisees. They saw Jesus raise Lazarus from the dead, and a lot of them still refused to believe. You would have think, oh my God, he raised somebody from the dead. He must be the Messiah. No, they crucified him instead. Amen. That's why Jesus said, it's the Spirit of God that draws people when you give the Word. His Spirit draws. Now, now, listen. So what happens then? So, so, so what happens now, though? Put that image again one more time, and I'm going to show you the next one. I'm almost done here. 
I want to, I want to, I want to end with you guys being happy. You look too sad. I, this is sobering, I know. It's sobering, isn't it? It is sobering. But, but it's good to know. Because people wonder. But, I'm, but here's the good news, though. In the next Sundays, I'm going to talk about all the good that's going to happen to us. So I had to, I had to, I had to, I had to show, I had to get this out of the way because we can't kid ourselves. This is for real. So notice, where did, so Jesus explained it in a story. Did you see that great gulf in between? There's that great gulf in between, right? There's a compartment, save Abraham's bosom, and notice the place of torment. And so there's those two compartments. But guess what? When, when Jesus died, so when Jesus died for three days, he went to Abraham's bosom. He's preaching the gospel. Amen. And everybody's hearing it. That's what Peter was given a clue there. He's preaching. He wasn't in torment. He already paid. At the cross is where the payment was made. Amen. Now listen though. Listen, listen. I know somebody will argue about pastor, Psalm 88 and whatever. Listen, that's referring to the cross. Yeah, but Jonah was three days. Yeah, but I understand Jonah, that again represents Hades where there's two compartments. Amen. In fact, Jonah represents the resurrection. When he was in Hades, God quickened him and spit him out of the fish. He prayed, it says, he says in Hades, he says in the belly of the fish I prayed and then boom, I was quickened, he said. That's, a, that's Jesus. Amen. He was raised from the dead with a glorified body. Amen. Now listen, so he goes to Hades, right? But here's, put the, new, new, the other image. Here's, here's what happened today. So what happened though, Ephesians, now before we go there, notice the saved compartment of, of Hades, which is, which is what? Abraham's bosom, after the cross and the resurrection, Jesus took him to heaven. Amen. That's the good news. Amen. Je now how about the other compartment? They're still there. Every unbeliever, there's only one compartment there now. It's torments. That unsaved compartment of hates, it's going to stay there until after the millennium at the great white throne judgment where they will be judged. God's going to judge them by their works because they didn't want to put their faith in Jesus' work. They'll be judged by their works. He's going to open books and he's going to look, okay, you didn't want to receive my son, so I'm going to, I'm going to check to see maybe, just see where you line up. Oh, oh, oh 85%, I'm sorry, Emma, my, my grade skill is 100%. Yeah, but I was 85 point. No, 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 no. And then, just in case I missed it, he's going to look at the book of life just to see if their name's written. And the Bible says anybody whose name was not written in the book of life will be thrown in the lake of fire. So you think this is bad, this place of torment, it's going to get worse for the unbeliever. Some, some people say, oh, I'd rather be in hell and, uh, uh, and party with them to be in heaven. Oh, really? Oh, really? You, uh, we got a guy there that just testified that he would want to see his brothers not go there. Right? So, so notice though, here's the good news though, for us believers, what? Paradise was taken to heaven. Can I prove it to you? Look at this, Ephesians chapter 4, verse 7 and 8. Ephesians 4, verse 7. But to each one of us grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Look at verse 8. Therefore he says, when he ascended on high, that's when Jesus went to heaven, he what? He led what? captivity, those that were captive in Abraham's bosom, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. When Jesus ascended, the Bible says there was like a cloud that met him. I believe it was the Old Testament saints. All the believers met Jesus in like in a, it looked like a cloud and they were taken straight to heaven. And now, now in the new covenant, when a, a believer here, and I'm going to give you what I'm going to share next week, now, when a believer dies, they go straight to heaven. No more Abraham's bosom, no compartment. There. You go straight to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So thank God. We have it so good. But I want to show you one last thing. Very interesting. Go to Matthew 27, verse 50 to 53. Remember when Jesus hanging on the cross? And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. Look at verse 51. Then behold, the veil of the temple was torn in two. That means the old covenant was done. Jesus was that veil that was crucified. Amen? So in other words, God made a way already. The way was made. See, that's why another reason that I don't think he was suffering in hell, torments Jesus. No, Jesus made the way. The, the, tip, the veil, Old Testament's fulfilled. He was torn in two from top to bottom. Listen, the earthquake and the rocks were split. Look at the next verse. 
Uh, have you ever heard this? Check this out. And the graves were opened. And listen, many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep, again, he's not meaning soul sleep, they had died in Christ, were raised. See, we never hear this. But what happened when Jesus died and whatever, that means tombs began to open up in the cemeteries. <laughs> and, and, they, and these people, so that means to me, because Jesus was raised, they were raised too. Ooh, look at the next verse. Check this out. And coming out of the graves after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. Did you think about that? We don't hear that. These Old Testament saints were raised, and after Jesus was raised, you got relatives that were showing up in Jerusalem on their door. Hey! No, they weren't showing up on the door. They walked through the wall. Hey! We don't hear this. But that is proof that now, because Jesus had paid the price, Abraham's bosom does not stay in the center of the earth anymore. They are free. They, they, now they can go straight to heaven. And after Jesus rose from the dead, I, I can imagine you got a Theo or a, an aunt or an uncle or a brother showing up at your house there at that time. And they show up, well, what are you doing here? I'm a, I mean, I'm, I'm alive. I'm alive. Now listen, listen, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give a warning here. That's the only time when you saw relatives who had died seeing them again. Amen. Don't you go be looking or be careful. Don't be asking for your, for your loved one. That's, if somebody appears to you that's your loved one, that's demonic. They can't come back now. They're with Jesus. So don't be praying or saying, oh, I wish my loved one would appear to me or whatever. Or you, you, you're inviting the devil to accommodate you. That's familiar spirits. Familiar spirits will speak and talk just like your relatives. So I give a warning. Don't, there's some people, they miss their loved one so much. Oh, I wish you would appear. No, 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 no. Don't do that. In fact, Saul, he ended up dying for messing around with, with whatever, but, but he actually got allowed to... Uh, uh, anyway, that's a whole other story, but just don't get into that. There's some people, why? Your loved one is with Jesus. Amen. Amen. You know, they're with Jesus. They're okay. They're okay, but you don't have to, amen, you don't have to, don't, don't be, I want to see you or whatever. The enemy might accommodate you. Don't do that. Amen? They're with Christ. So praise God. Did you, are you learning something? Yeah. I had to lay this groundwork because now next week we're going to talk about those things that will happen when a believer dies. Amen? Amen? What's going to happen? I already gave you one of them. You're going to be present with the Lord. Exactly when you die. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Thank you so much for the things we're learning today, Father. And I just pray, Father, that your word will not return void. But it will accomplish that which you sent it to accomplish. Now, if there's anyone here, man, this is real. The hell is real. Just as much as heaven is real. But you don't have to go there. Because Jesus made a way. So if you're in here, and you've never made Jesus your Savior, or you have any question or doubt, you don't have to fear death if Jesus is your Savior. Amen? It's not difficult. You just have to trust that He died on the cross for your sins, that He was buried and paid for your sins, and rose again as Lord and Savior of all. And, and believe that and accept Him as your Savior. So if there's anyone in this place, I want to pray for you. Is there anyone in this place? I'd like to pray for you that prayer. Hallelujah. Again, now, if you've already accepted Jesus, don't get into fear or whatever. You never, don't allow fear and doubt or whatever. To, amen? If, if the Bible says if, if you confess Jesus is Lord and believe in your God, that God raised Him from the, in your heart, I mean, that God raised Him from the dead, you will be saved. Amen. amen. It's simple. Believe, another scripture says, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. But I want to lead everybody in a prayer just in case there's someone watching or whatever or hearing that has never made Jesus their Lord and Savior. Let's go ahead and pray this together. Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father thank, you for your word. thank you for your word. I've heard the gospel, heard the gospel of, what Jesus did for us. of what Jesus did for us. I come to you, come to you and, recognize and recognize 
that as a sinner, as a sinner I, would go to hell. I would go to hell. But I choose to accept Jesus, I choose to accept Jesus. And, believe and believe what Jesus did for me. I believe he died on that cross for all my sins, that he was buried, and that he rose again on the third day as Lord of all. Jesus, I receive you as my Savior and my Lord. I receive your forgiveness from all my sins. Make me a new creation. Change me, now. Change me now, and from this day forward, this day forward by, your grace, by your grace, I will serve you. Will serve you. In, Jesus name. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. 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 Calvary, I know Jesus, the joy, the one.